Welcome to another interview by Markets Policy Partners. These interviews augment their newsletter that selects news from around the world that either supports or refutes theories about key issues impacting how markets move and how policy is formed. John Fagan, Brendan Walsh, and Bob Dewey spent their careers in institutional investing and John went on to be the director of the Markets Room in the Treasury Department, where he translated what markets were saying to policymakers and how policies would impact markets. Welcome. My name is Brendan Walsh from Markets Policy Partners. I'm joined, as always, <clears throat> with my colleague, John Fagan. And today we have a special guest, uh, both a, a, a colleague, but also a good friend, uh, Jack Wright. So Jack was the uh, executive director at J.P. Morgan in New York. He also worked in London and in Australia, so in Hong Kong, too. You've been all over the world. <laughs> Uh, but now he made a, a very interesting transition. He's a journalist contributor to the Washington Post, Australian Financial Review, among others. He also recently lost a podcast called The Intersection, which is doing quite well and just cracked up, uh, cracked 5% of uh, global streams, where he's interviewed many high profile sources on current issues. So, uh, Jack, welcome. Uh, but also, uh, what are you working on now? Uh, there's plenty going on. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, Brendan. Um, I think the main focus at the moment in terms of news flow is around um, the economy and markets as we look toward the 2024 presidential election and in view of what occurred at the midterms. Um, and then all of those same old uh, geopolitical considerations, which you know are evolving quite quickly, um, all around the world. I mean, the obvious one in Ukraine and, and, and Eastern Europe in general, but also, you know, there's a lot happening in Asia um, around Taiwan um, uh, and and with the response to China's incrementalism. And uh, we can touch on all that as well, if you'd like. Without a doubt. Uh, well, maybe uh, this is kind of a big week for financial markets. We have a Fed uh, meeting. We have a very important uh, inflation CPI print tomorrow. Um, John, uh, how do you see the, the week kind of setting up? Yeah, this really is the last big gauntlet we've got to run before year end. And uh, it is uh, going to be maybe a little daunting. Markets got the chills last week. There was a sense that uh, that the run up uh, over the past month in anticipation of this Fed downshift, which everybody is expecting to see on Wednesday, uh, mm -hmm. might, might have gotten a little bit ahead of itself. Um, and uh, and that has been kind of the message the Fed speakers have been sending, which is, yes, we're going to be uh, they, they've been at pains to try to explain to the market that uh, the move from 75 basis point increments in the tightening cycle to a 50 basis point increment, which we expect uh, on Wednesday, is not an easing by any stretch of the imagination. It doesn't mean they're done. They're still hammering tongs, fighting inflation. The job isn't done. They're punching, you know, themes like a higher terminal rate that is going to have to be with us for longer. This is very much a verbal fighting retreat is, I think, uh, how we've characterized it from. Oh, totally, the, because I think they realize from an economic perspective, they need to slow down. They probably already over tightened, but they don't want markets. They want financial conditions to remain tight so they, they can't have the, the stock market rallying 10 percent. So they're doing everything they can to make uh, to slow the pace of hikes with also trying to hope that the I think they would actually like the market to go down, but at a minimum, they don't want it to go up. Yeah. How are you seeing this, Jack? I, I think they're dealing with a really difficult sort of conceptual problem, right? Which is that there's different types of inflation. And the inflation that we're seeing in the US economy at the moment is not demand pull inflation, which comes from higher wages, more savings, more spending. Um, this is cost push inflation, which comes from problems on the supply side of the equation, a lot of which stemmed from COVID, and there are all other sorts of external considerations that feed into that. But, you know, I think as 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 policymakers, the, the FOMC understand that, but they also, the forward guidance piece of what they do is still incredibly important. So they, they sort of need to find a way to um, soften yeah. the monetary um, tool or use of the monetary tool while still trying to maintain, um, you know, some semblance of, uh, of of looking like they're being prudent, and and I just think it's a very difficult line to walk. Um, you know, yeah. I think that I, my my personal view is that those you know seventy five bit hikes and stuff are. I, I mean, maybe that's what they had to do. Maybe this was their plan all along to get a bunch of it out of the way early and then slow down. Um, but it's been hard to draw a line between 
the more hawkish policy stance of central banks all around the world and the global outlook for inflation, because what's driving it is is not monetary. Right. Yeah. yeah. And all of the, a lot of the supply chain constraints that was caused by COVID, which caused you know a huge spike in prices like you know lumber and 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 used car prices. Th- those are are back to to pre level co- uh, pre COVID levels. Uh, shipping rates have have fallen off a cliff in the last three months, and we're back to you know to to normal levels. And actually, when you look at the the oil markets, we're starting to price in you know recessionary kind of levels. Yeah. yeah. And and. But- Gone. We, we've seen we've just seen the Federal Reserve cherry pick the data. Right. You know, and that has been something that has given. Yeah, and then they had the cherry pick. Yeah. yeah. And, and so they, they have, you know, to justify further tightening, which is what they're going to be doing. You know, this is why tomorrow's CPI number is the, the market is just bound to overreact. Right. A, mm-hmm. a, a half a percent or, you know, a tenth of a percent upside downside surprise. And there's going to be a knee jerk market reaction because there's a sense that the Fed will latch on to anything that yeah. is they're so scared of their own shadow in terms of inflation that they're going to latch on to any evidence that it's not getting better. When the preponderance of evidence clearly shows, and a lot of Fed officials have finally begun to admit it over the past couple of months, that things are going in the right direction. But right. they don't want to, they feel as though obviously that by talking about the successes that they've having, they they might diminish the the effectiveness of their tightening because the the very act of of acknowledging progress loosens monetary conditions. So it's sort yeah. of a, uh, you know. And they're in a quick dynamic too. too. I mean, Mark Carney, uh, you know, the governor of the Bank of England, yeah. he he wrote his doctoral thesis on the impact of forward guidance and, and the signaling mechanism of monetary policy as opposed to the actual tactile impact that it has on economic conditions. And they're just as important as each other, both, right? So I think it is, I think it's a tough one. The, the other, I think the latest um, development, which is very important to consider in this discussion is, is that China is lifting the zero COVID policy, right? Yep. So um, that's not always uh, thought about or discussed in the same breath as inflation onshore in the US, but the two are inextricably linked. Um, the policy... The zero COVID policy has obviously been, you know, dramatically impactful in terms of how it's impacted China's exports um, and the just the number of widgets effectively that they're able to put into the global economy. And I think given they seem to be backing down on that, um, on the back of the, the civil unrest, you know, that's probably bullish for Martin. It's probably, um, you know, it, it means inflation should soften. At, at, yeah. at the same time, though, one of the things that we are seeing with the COVID uh, zero rollback is a lot of uncertainty around whether this is going to turn into a public health nightmare in China. And, you know, wow. one of the reasons they didn't do it <laughs> was because the risks around the, the public health system. There was some heartburn overnight. The Chinese markets have had a really nice run up on this, this, this sort of double barreled rollback of COVID uh, zero, but also obviously greater expressions of intent to stimulate the economy, some uh, metrics trying to uh, facilitate loans in the property segment and push lending. We saw the aggregate dem- uh, credit numbers come out last night. They were a huge improvement on uh, on October, but they were still below expectations. There's a uh, there's whenever things you know seem to go right for China, there seems to be an equal and opposite <laughs> reaction in the other way. And uh, the question of, you know, if the Why hasn't oil, you know, oil has been, uh, you know, it's a really key aspect, right? If you told me that China was going to be so quick to roll back its COVID zero um, policies, I would have said, well, oil prices are up, you know, up five bucks, up eight bucks. And uh, and they've been quite the opposite. So it's a it's a much more nuanced uh, kind of dynamic than than we maybe had expected uh, when when it just started. Yeah. And it's surprising. Right, like how quickly they seem. If you you know, if if the reporting's good, that they seem to have changed their tune on this. The well, China, it was the it was it, the World it, Cup. Sorry, it was the World Cup. It never dawned on them that a billion Chinese are going to be watching people that have returned to normal, and you know, a hundred thousand people in a packed stadium without masks on. Yeah, it, right. They forgot and, to they forgot to blur blur the stands out. 
Yeah, that's right. But I mean, the the other thing which it speaks to, which is a really interesting um, high level sort of geopolitical point about China, is that as as much as President Xi has written his name into the constitution and is taking a third term, and for all intents and purposes has authoritarian control over that system, <laughs> now, um, they do really, really worry about civil unrest, right? Like I was in, um, I was in DC recently um, interviewing for the podcast. I interviewed um, Joe Hockey, who's the former Australian ambassador to the US, and he was the treasurer of Australia for a long time. So he he managed that relationship with China, and the, the trade in iron ore between Australia and China is enormous, right? Um, so he has a a pretty good handle on on, on you know some of the internal um, discussions that happen within the the um, the PCC. And he said that he gave an example of when, remember when the Malaysian plane crashed, it disappeared, MH17, not the one that the Russians shot down, the one that that disappeared in the Indian Ocean. When that happened, he said President Xi was phoning up Tony Abbott, who was the Prime Minister of Australia all the time, um, daily, and, you know, discussing the, the, the effort to locate the plane, et cetera, because there was a number of Chinese nationals on board. And he used that as an example of you know, even in a relatively small scale situation, they do they do really, you know, adhere to that government should be f- afraid of their people sort of, um, you know, uh, idea. And I think uh, I think this is like a it's a little bit surprising, but it also might be a reason to moderate some of the more alarmist interpretations of what China's you know things like foreign policy might look like going forward towards Taiwan. Um, it shows you that. As much as it is a very restrictive authoritarian regime, you know there is a consideration there of what they ultimately can get past the citizenry without triggering some sort of revolt. Well, yeah. What about the, the war in Ukraine? That has to make the, the Chinese leaders uh, worried about what an invasion of Taiwan is going to look like. You know, uh, there's actually water in between the two countries. Unlike Russia, we can just drive tanks in. Well, there's another problem as well. It's called the American Navy, yep. but you know uh, that which which is um, something of an obstacle. But I, I, you know, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think the the parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan are impossible to ignore, and I think that um, that the the leadership in Beijing, you know, presumably would be very uh, aware and attuned to the way one that the global sort of community has. Um, banded together against Russia, um, but also they'd be looking at what's happening onshore in Russia in terms of civil unrest, in yep. terms of what happened when they tried to mobilise the reservists, and saying, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea. So, like, you know, this isn't something that I've written in a newspaper article, but my my senses tell me that um, that the zero COVID backflip probably, on the balance of things, makes makes the outlook a little less um, worrying in Asia. That that is definitely a it the the rollback of zero COVID definitely shows some rational <laughs> rational acting alignment with the rest of the world. It is sensible, and as you say, you know the fact that there is a disciplinary function that comes from public opinion. Um, it's it, it's it's an important point to make. I think that you know that the those positives aside. When you look at the U.S.-China relations from Washington, D.C., there's still no constituency apparent that is looking to roll back uh, meaningfully some of the uh, restrictions, particularly on high tech and ships and so forth uh, that have been levied against China. We had been you know, we'd been telling our clients uh, ahead of the Biden administration that the Biden administration, uh, you know, unlike sort of conventional wisdom, where there was a sense that they might come in and roll back some of the Trump uh, anti-China stuff, that they were going to take that ball and run with it and do it in their mm-hmm. own way. And uh, and I think that that really has uh, has borne out. And uh, we don't think that in the next two years of the first term that there's really going to be a big change on that. And so the national security imperative of reshoring of that in, that burgeoning industrial policy comeback that we've seen uh, kind of start out under Trump and be carried forward under President Biden, uh, you know, the the these sort of common threads underneath the partisan divide are things that are very interesting to us. And that is, you know, long term, 
although there might be short term uh, disinflationary aspect, I think, to what you said with the zero COVID going away. Mm -hmm. The long term, this balkanization of of global supply chains um, and uh, the sort of national security (laughs) implications of economics, uh, economics essentially and and trade being swept under uh, Mm -hmm. national security. That's structurally inflationary. Uh, you know, the scramble for resources, uh, that the empowerment of labor. I mean, some of these are outgrowths of what we've seen in the COVID era, but some of them are just, you know, they're just the, the way that, uh, that developments have evolved. And, uh, you know, when you put them all together, elevated energy prices, it doesn't look like that's going to be, uh, you know, despite the relief that we've seen here in the short term, probably not uh, going to be a, a massive relief going forward. So it's a it's a structurally higher inflationary environment in our view, um, and and that kind of calls the tune for next year, which is you know we see inflation continuing to improve and growth slowing, but the lagged impacts of monetary tightening and dollar strength hit next year, and yeah. uh, and the inflationary you know dynamics are going to be coming down, but you know there's a risk that they are sticky. And when we look at one of the big chances for mispricing, we're circling the Fed fund futures that are calling for rate cuts in the second half of, of next year with the Fed saying, no way are we doing that? And the market saying, oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> and so it'll be a very interesting. That's going to be a really big pivot point uh, in yeah. global macro next year. Look, I think that the point about the, the, it does feel very much like we're at a paradigm shift in terms of how to interpret the outlook for markets in general. Right. So. Post 08, you know, the, 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 the long term impact of quantitative easing in the United States, obviously, but also in places like Japan um, and, and uh, the Eurozone, like over, over that period, one of, the, one of the really noticeable and obvious impacts that has had is that cross asset correlations have basically gone to one, right? Which means that. Leading into the financial crisis, typically equities would rally when bonds sold off, bonds would rally when equities sold off, and you know, yeah. that seesaw was viewed as a, you know, a, tr- a tug of war between a risk off and risk on sort of attitude towards what risk appetite would look like globally in the markets. Um, and you had a, a relatively weak uh, dollar. Right. And, and so during... You know, in, in the lead up to 08, in the 20 years leading up to 08, say, um, or post to, say 2000 to 2008, you know, th- that that inverse correlation meant that, you know, the, the, the prevalence of things like 60-40 funds, which, you know, hold yeah, equity yeah. bonds that are trying to sort of net out returns through the cycle, all of that sort of stuff was very popular. But what happens when you start printing money unlimitedly? Or, or, that's not a word, I don't think, unlimitedly. When you start printing <laughs> unlimited <laughs> money, um, is is that ultimately you put so much cash into the pockets of of the market that everybody just has to own everything. And that's what happened. And that's also what I think is unwinding. Um, So you're 100% right. I mean, I think we can talk about this later, but FTX is a great example. They did their their Series A round in 2019. This thing wasn't around very long. The the, the world was just so awash with money. Yeah, let's talk about FTX later because- because, because, and you could get anything. You could raise as much money uh, as you wanted. So. Yeah, and, and and it's absolutely the same point. You're right. But let's talk about it after, just because I, I feel like it. the crypto is such a lightning rod for a million dollars. Oh, no, I totally agree. But, but that's a great but, example but, of, you know. Of, yeah. of the fact that money was too easy, right? Like, exactly. You know, when, when rates are low, the, the hurdle rate that an investor needs um, in order to deploy capital is also low. I mean, there's a reason why SoftBank have been running around the world for 15 years, putting extraordinarily large amounts of money into businesses that are broke and and losing it. And it's because Japan's had 20 years of deflation, right? And so, you know, that means for that 20-year period, if you could find an asset that just held its value, it appreciated in real terms. Now, that's just a very simple piece of uh, logic that applies very clearly now in the Western world. Like, no, without a doubt, capital is going up and the yeah. free money is gone. And the very thin end of the wedge is what you're talking about, Brendan, which is like venture capital and and that sort of stuff. But it but it impacts the whole space. And without a doubt, you know, because now when I mean, we're just talking about, there's a lot of uncertainty going into 2023. You, you can get a four percent yield on a two-year bond. You know that the government's going to pay that back money. 
<laughs> Definitely in the two years. Oh, wait, wait. Well, we have to talk about the debt ceiling, so maybe not. <laughs> oh, yes. We, we will talk about that later. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other really interesting sort of thing, I think, at the, mo- at the moment to try and interpret for markets is the political side post the midterms. Yep. Um, so I, um, I went out on the campaign trail in the lead up to the elections Um and I, you know, I went to Trump events and and Biden events, and I was in DC on the day of the ballot. Um, and the feedback, you know, like what what you hear at these rallies is really interesting. Um, you know, at the at the Trump rallies, everyone is is focused on the economy, right? Um, and which is weird because what Trump is talking about is all the old stuff about stolen elections and fentanyl flooding across the border and all this sort of stuff. But when you speak to the the actual rally goers, most people's response when you ask them what the biggest issue was, was the economy's broken and I blame Joe Biden for that, right? And, yeah. and you know, I think as much as I think that, polit- you know, that the Republicans are being pretty dishonest in the way that they're projecting blame upon democratic politics for the current state of inflation, there are elements of what they're saying which are totally fair. Things like their more permissive attitude towards fracking and fossil, you know, exploration and, and transport of fossil fuels would be a really, really good way to deal with non-core inflation, right? And the the Democrats don't have that as part of their policy agenda. So, you know, I think this sort of stuff is going to matter going forward, but the Republicans need somebody who can articulate the differences in their policy offering in a compelling way. Um, and, and I don't think that, you know, Trump certainly didn't do that in what I saw. Um, the, the results of the midterms, I think, you know, this is a huge upset. No, nobody saw this coming. You know, incumbent administrations always lose at midterm elections because voters who are angered by the performance of the administration they didn't vote in are more likely to show up than those who are comfortable that their guy's going to be in the big job for another two years. Um, but you know, this, this went the other way. Um, you know, Biden won better midterm results than Obama, than Clinton. Um, and this is all against a backdrop of soaring consumer price inflation, which is very negative for governments in general when they go to the polls. Um, and also in a, in the context of him being, you know, not a very compelling president, you know, in, in, in my well, it's quite opinion, fascinating. you know, I mean, I don't yeah. want to, I'm not trying to be too judgmental there and I don't want people to overinterppret this, no, but, no, but you're you know, he's been point. bad in front of the camera, right? Yeah, and and but, I think but, Joe Biden, if you just, the, the, the bills that he passed, you may agree or not, but the amount of legislation that Biden passed in the first two years, and then by not getting swept and, and be able to hold the Senate is, is, fairly unprecedented. It's one of the best two years, first two years of any president that we've ever had. Um, but he's still, I mean, his poll numbers have gone up a little lately, but they're still very disappointing. And and most people don't want him to run for president again. <laughs> well, also including himself, from what I can deduce, right? Like, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like he's, he's winding up for a big announcement. It more feels like they're trying to figure out how to get their house in order, right? Yeah. And I think you know, that could, I don't know, but I think it's unlikely that he runs again, right? And 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 if he doesn't, you know, I think um, the Democrats have got to find someone compelling, and they've done that twice before in recent memory um, in Obama and Clinton in terms of found, you know, candidates who weren't particularly well-known at the midterms ahead of the presidential elections they won. But I think um, it kind of blows the race wide open. Like, I don't think that the, the midterm result is automatically positive for the Democrats in 2024. I think it's negative for Trump's, um, you know, sort of fortunes in, in, if, if he does, you know, uh, win the nomination. But I think, yeah. I think it has the real that, effect of just blowing the race wide open, which could be a very good thing. Like a breath of fresh air into American politics is long overdue. Yeah. And I think the Dobbs Supreme Court ruling played a large role in the Democrats' success. Um, where where that kind of swing voter voted, um, you know, to, to have some rational um, restrictions on abortion rather than an outright ban, like yes, in some states. That that feeds into the narrative of candidate quality and sort of candidate extremism. There was a sense that the Republicans uh, set themselves up to fail by choosing, uh, you know, yeah. far outliers. 
But, you know, that that is that's the way that the Republican Party is oriented right now. And it leaves you with this conundrum. Can you win the you know primary and the general? And that is uh, right. you know, with the with it, it's so many of the, uh, you know, the the very, you know, ex, the MAGA candidates and that sort of thing. They they obviously underperformed a lot of the Trump endorsed candidates just were. You know, they were they weren't aligned with where voters were, it seemed. And, uh, you know, and the Democrats were able to capitalize on that by putting, you know, relatively measured candidates uh, in these seats. You know, not nothing. They they didn't counter with extremes. Right. They countered with relatively uh, middle of the road candidates who kind of ran away from Joe Biden's, um, you know, presidency, if not his policies. And, uh, you know, that the the, the set, the, the scene that it really sets is, you know, this circular firing squad in the GOP right now, which is, you know, most most of the, you know, the whispers you hear in the background are GOP operatives saying we, we hope he doesn't run. But everybody knows he's going to run as long as President Trump, uh, former President Trump is breathing. He is going to run. If he's not the Republican nominee, he's going to run on his own and split. Yeah, yeah no, he's definitely. I mean, it's yeah, it's. I mean, so, it's, it's they, uh, it was difficult. It's one of those things where, in hindsight, it feels like why were we even discussing? You know, if he was or not, because of the vigor with which he seems to have come out. Um, you know, after the fact, but yeah. I, I still think that what that tells you, what you're describing tells you is something important, which is that but for the last electoral, for, certainly for the 2016 electoral cycle, you know, the Republican voters were able to hold their noses um, and the Republicans were able to capture both that Trump base, which is disaffected, non-college educated white folks pretty much, um, and also hang on to enough of, you know, the the well, in fact, they won Pennsylvania, so they probably arguably won more of the sort of the suburban middle class white vote. And that now looks like it might be starting to cut the other way. Now, the, 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 the reason, though, that it's hard to, to be confident in that assessment is that midterms, by their very nature, are hard to, be, to draw hard conclusions from because someone who didn't show up to the midterms may still show up to the presidential election and may still vote for President Trump just because he's a Republican. That's that's absolutely fair. And uh, and obviously, two years is they say a week is eternity in politics and two years. I mean, oh, <laughs> your crystal yeah. ball is completely clouded in the future. But, you know, there, in terms of the things that are most certain, the highest conviction uh, aspects of the, the future picture are President Trump, as long as he's breathing, is going to run. And if he's going to run, uh, then the Republican primary could potentially be a complete bloody fray. And if the, the conventional wisdom is in Washington, D.C., is that if Trump runs, Biden is going to run against him. If Trump is out yeah. for some reason, legal trouble or whatever it is, then Biden would, you know, move to the move to the wing and let someone else take let let someone else take a crack at DeSantis or, you know, whoever the, the emerges from the Republican primaries. Um, but that's you know, there, there are lots of uncertainty. That, do people think that because they think that the Democratic National Committee believes that Biden is the best opponent to Trump as a candidate in 2024? Or is it because Biden has a personal um, beef with him or what, what, what's it's, informing that view? The, what we've heard is that it's Biden himself thinks that he matches up very well with Trump. He beat him once and he's going to beat him again if he needs to. Um, but, you know, he is he he views himself as having that obligation to make sure that Trump stays out of the Oval Office. And uh, and he right. believes that he is the best candidate um, to ensure that that happens. Now, you know, obviously that might be true in his mind today, but it could change down the road for a variety. Sure, of yeah, yeah. No, it's just a really interesting piece of feedback. Um, God, I hope that's not the the two um, nominees in twenty twenty four. Yeah, it it would be it would be a it would be an uninspiring kind of choice in a lot of ways. I think for many oh, Americans, more of the same. But, you know, this is this is the reality we live in in the uh, in the political atmosphere, and you know, we'll see. I mean, the the Congress. I mean, we talked about it before, despite the. 
you know, trench warfare of bipartisanship. There's a lot in common uh, between these two parties right now. The U.S. Mm-hmm. The yeah, Washington that's what I was just going to ask. You know, we, we have a divided government, but we have two more years uh, to make some legislation. Obviously, mm-hmm. uh, hopefully we can not default on our debt. But there are a lot of, of, of bipartisan um, opportunities that, that, that could come, uh, you know, with a, a Senate controlled by the House. I mean, the Democrats on a a House controlled, a very, very narrow uh, control uh, for the Republicans in the House. Yeah. And so when we think about the kind of things that legislatively they can do, you know, obviously on the U.S. China side, it'll be more in the executive branch, but there's going to be no blowback from congressional Republicans uh, as far as we can tell on what the Biden administration is doing. They're all on board with it. Um, And they're in, you know, they're in execution mode on these uh, bills, the CHIPS Act, and uh, and so forth that have been put in place. Same thing with infrastructure that's grinding along in the background. It's happening in red states just as well as blue states. Um, and uh, and so where, you know, after this big legislative sprint, what are they going to be able to do? You know, in this lame duck session, they're going to try to avoid a government shutdown on the 16th, the marriage equality, obviously. And, uh, you know, and then uh, it's going to be it's going to be debt ceiling, right? Um, that's that's a big that's going to be a big issue for next year, and uh, and that could tie up a lot of, um, you know, could tie up a lot of legislative energies, a lot of negotiation uh, bandwidth up on Capitol Hill, depending on how it plays out. Yeah, that's always the way to try and interpret the, or read the tea leaves on the debt ceiling, isn't it? It's not that they're not going to do it; they're going to do it. But it's what other trade-offs that are going to have to be given away by different people in order to get there. Yeah, it's it, it looks as though when we saw the New York Times report that the signals they were getting is that it's not going to happen in the lame duck. They just don't have the bandwidth to do it. I'd be a little bit cautious with that. You know, this is the kind of thing that the that people, you know, that members on Capitol Hill would dearly love to sneak out there in, uh, you know, in sort of a holiday lame duck, you know, don't look at me. I didn't do it. You know, nothing, ha- nothing to see here. We raised the debt, debt limit and just kicked it. But we'll we'll assuming that it doesn't get done, which I think is probably narrowly the base case. It's then, like the equivalent of um, the equivalent of pardons in during the transition for the executive branch. Post the midterms, there's like just a bunch, a bunch of debt ceiling reform that's just shoved through as they as they walk. Oh, it's funny. They'd be wise to do it, but it doesn't. It's it's certainly not the base case at this point. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's 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 not a open and shut. It's not a zero percent chance. But if it slides to next year. The Republican House has said and, you know, McCarthy's trying to cobble together leadership. And I'm sure that the far right um, in the party is saying, well, you've got to if we're going to support you, then you've got to go. You know, you've got to take this, you know, to the nth degree and see what we can get out of it. Um, And uh, and the Democrats don't have a terrific negotiating position, uh, although they do have, you know, the the narrow majority for the Republicans in the House is maybe pretty tough to hold in the face of, you know, U.S. credit worthiness. And Mitch McConnell has proven time and time again that he's no fan of this game of chicken. So, uh, you know, the there are some important players and important dynamics uh, that can, you know, short circuit the worst case scenario here. Like like, as you say, Jack, we usually see <laughs> 11th hour. <laughs> yeah, I mean. If if they default, like it's kind of game over. It's not game over, but it's it just it completely resets the whole playing field. And I don't think that it's like it's, it's also one of those risks that if you're sitting around an investment committee meeting, right? Like you can't say we've got to sell down risk because of the debt ceiling. Everyone's like, yeah, no, exactly. What are it's you talking risk. about? We we've, we've seen this movie how many times? We always know that it's a terrifying, you know high wire act and then they always figure it out in the end so it's, well, it's one also of one of those that, ones where if you're right about it like wh- you got to go home anyway right yeah exactly like if you're a fund manager sitting on madison avenue and you convince you you know the founder of your fund that the u.s is going to default on its sovereign debt <laughs> yeah what have you won by winning that other than the fact that your fund is about <laughs> to shut down you know <laughs> right like, <laughs> yeah exactly and so, so it's we've best actually everybody just yeah. Interesting story. When I was at Treasury and one of these fights was coming up, we heard signals from the Democrats on Capitol Hill saying, you know, why aren't financial markets evidencing more fear uh, of this outcome? And it would help. It would be a disciplinary function, you know, if the markets were showing some flashing some concerns to our Republican colleagues who are trying to drive this thing. And, you know, our response was essentially what we just said, which is you can't convince markets that this is going to be uh, that that it's really going to go over the cliff. 
because they've just, it, mm-hmm. it hasn't ever happened in the past. And it's almost, if it does, if there is an accident by definition, it will be a horrifying surprise. Yeah, it's, the gun threat of it is never going to work. That's the problem, right? That's why why the same thing happens right. over and over again. I agree. Yeah, so what can they get done? Legislation on crypto, legislation on stable coins. At this point, crypto, you know, we've heard this again and again from policymakers after the FTX debacle, which is, hey, look, now if we legislate, are we, you know, giving this asset class kind of our stamp of approval? Are we legitimizing it by creating a a legislative and regulatory structure? Maybe we should just let nature take its course. I don't think that logic applies when they're talking about stable coins, but, um, uh, and, you know, the central bank digital currencies, et cetera, et cetera, and the broader, you know, and the ongoing, uh, you know, consumer protection, anti money laundering, tax uh, compliance, and that sort of, those are always, those processes are always going to be running in terms of enforcement. But a grand, you know, a, a grand legislative approach toward crypto. You know, it looked like it might have been coming through with that uh, that bill that was going to kick it over to the CFTC. But now it, it's uh, I think it's a it's a much more challenging thing. So, the, well, uh, I mean, it's, it's probably worth talking a little bit about because I think what's happening in crypto markets is very important for, for the broader economy. Like. What's becoming undeniably clear as each incremental new entity, which is sort of deeply inserted into the plumbing of the entire crypto ecosystem fails is that what is absolutely needed is regulation and particularly regulation around disclosure. So, you know, all of these frauds and scams and failures and, you know, lump them all together. This is just like the greatest hits of what has happened in the traditional financial markets over like the last 80 years. Yeah, it's a great and just point. compressed into this rapid, you know, time frame, right? Like you literally, like I mean, FTX is Enron. Like I mean, th- th- that really is, you know, kind of a pretty good analogy for what's on here. Um, obviously, there's loads of differences, but the the silver bullet to all of this, and it does, it doesn't. In the there's still frauds in the traditional financial markets. It doesn't mean there'll never be another fraud again. But the silver bullet in terms of an easy step to protect consumers is is disclosure. And I think, you know, it's it's hard to um, police rules as a regulator in crypto because it naturally sort of operates in a supernational sort of way. Um, but at the end of the day, if people, if your average retail investor in crypto understood that when you give your money to a decentralized finance platform, who's then going to print you back 20% returns, that that money might not be there when you want it back. Like just that is like such a crucial step in the understanding the relationship between risk and return, which has been absent in, in crypto markets. Now there's another layer of regulation, which is, you know, making sure that firms are actually doing what they disclose they do. And that's the FTX question, right? Because that really just looks like basically what they were doing was just completely illegal, uh, you know, in any other financial instrument, which is that the minute that the separate managed accounts are perforated in a regulated financial institution, that's curtains, guys. Game over. And someone's going to jail. Like, you cannot access client funds for any purpose that is not, <laughs> you know, it's just not allowed. And, yeah. you know, people try to liken this to the banking system. Well, when you put your money in a deposit account, you know, and whether or not you understand how the model works or you read the T's and C's, but it is expressly stated to you that that money will then be lent out for the bank to earn a net interest margin, which is how they make money. When you give money to a decentralized finance platform or to FTX, which is just meant to be a custodian, they're not meant to be going out and trying to do business with your money. And that's just what's been going on. Yeah. Um, And the argument that, you know, the the, uh, you know, mistakes were made, we fouled up, you know, this is this is, you know, I think back to my criminal law course in law school and the difference between negligence and gross negligence. Negligence is driving 70 miles an hour, you know, on a on a 35 mile an hour road. Gross negligence is driving 75 miles an hour on the sidewalk. Right. Yeah. There's a point where like <laughs> yeah. your negligence is so like so outrageous 
But it, yeah. it's impossible to separate it from like, you know, real bad action and uh, and that, you know, the the, the fraud and, and criminality that uh, that, you know, we all suspect really was was behind it. But, yeah. you know, there were also disorganized criminals as well. And uh, and that's, you know, that that's muddying the waters to some extent, the the very confusing regulatory you know, the jurisdictions and that sort of stuff. It's um... I mean, it's it's no surprise that it's happened, right? Because the technology allows people to transfer money anonymously between one another, right? At the end of the day. And it's it's probably not that surprising that the whole sort of gamut of different financial fraud has emerged in such a short window of time when you're talking about the internet and tech, you know, tech savvy plugged in people. Sure. And, but, um... and it goes back to what we were talking about before that, you know, how many how many strategies? It's not just crypto. You cannot kind of lump in like passive investing. And just as you said, the 60, 40, these are and just not as, as extreme an example, but these are strategies that have really mushroomed in this hothouse environment that we've mm. had over the past decade plus, where the air has just been thick with liquidity and, uh, you know, <laughs> with the central banks, uh, you know, any anything can sprout up in that kind of humid and uh, and liquidity drenched environment, and when I you like open that analogy, the greenhouse, yeah, to the, like to the a terrarium, December and high terrarium for financial fraud. A yeah, dish. I mean, we saw it on Twitter. Someone said, you know, the twenties, the the catchphrase for investing in the twenties is the tangible twenties. And uh, you know, we've been joking that uh, you know structurally higher interest rates uh, make for a a bear market for BS essentially, and uh, yeah. you know, real. This is this is the kind of environment that brings you back to, you know, real fundamental value and thinking about what value really means. Yeah, the world's been short rates for three decades, you know, like, I mean, it, 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 and it's and it's changing. And I think structurally, you're right. It's it's good. I mean, the, the other thing which all this might do is trigger, if it hasn't already, like a bit of a mindset shift in terms of how we think about blockchain technology and decentralized ledger technology. You know, from from the beginning, I think it's been, and this is not to, you know, it's hindsight and say, I knew this was all going to happen. I've, I've never bought any crypto, which has been wrong. You know, I, I'm the dummy in this room. But I, I, think, um, I think the other applications of decentralized ledger technology are a lot more compelling than currencies, right? So like you think about things like insurance, like yeah. the ability to bilaterally approach another private individual or another counterparty, let's say, and have a record of what cars you've owned every time you've had an accident, every time you got a speeding ticket, how much money's in your bank account and where you live, that's trustworthy and that updates in real time. The implications of that for something like insurance is are dramatic. Um, and perhaps you know, we're getting closer to, you know, those sort of adoptions attracting the attention of some of the best and brightest who are looking at this stuff, right? Um, it's always going to be hard to convince, you know, the latest shit hot coder out of MIT to go and use his or her skills to work for Prudential when they can go and live in the Bahamas and, you know, make millions of dollars a year, right? But once that the sort of dining room, the, the 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 table gets pulled out from under that, like I mean, I think I think perhaps we will see a little bit more of a growth in some of the other applications, which I think will be really quite fascinating. Yeah, exactly. It goes back to that fundamental question. Okay, so what does it do? You know, tell me what it does, like yep. in a real world setting. And if you can explain that, and and for blockchain, just as you say, the uh, the applications for insurance the applications for banking the underserved and you know some of these other applications for its streamlining payment systems and uh, and reducing the costs in 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 that realm those are those are real world applications with real value and you can you can really you know hang a number on those yeah i was talking to a guy the other day we were laughing about this saying like it's like when they made they changed from paper i know you in america you still have paper money but everywhere else in the world that has polymer notes right like plastic was good, but there are other uses for plastic. Like that, that's kind of the that's kind of a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> We're back to the the advice from the in the graduate. One word for you: plastics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, Great old movie. Yeah. Um, 
What else do you guys think is sort of on the front of at the top of people's minds right now um, in terms of, I don't know, markets or politics or anything else? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the when you look at the tea leaves, it really is the markets are giving you scattered signals. Right. And the mm. the the bet next year is, you know, really pivoting on how deep and long the recession is going to be. There are you know, there are plenty of people that think, well, maybe we'll escape a recession. But, you know, it's the base case. I think it's the operative base case for for most um, economists and market participants are certainly behaving in uh, in ways that are you know consistent with expectations of a pretty challenging growth year next year and um, and then you know in in the face of that you know what's the central bank reaction function uh, and you know when we think about that as as I mentioned the the biggest potential mispricing of uh, of next year's uh, macro outcomes could be about that you know, Fed rate cut expectation in the back half of the year. And if you've got really dismal economic growth and you have, you know, much lower, but still kind of sticky high above target inflation, the Fed, they're stubborn, you know, they're being very stubborn in terms of persisting in their upside rate hikes. And we think that that's going to be nothing compared to the stubbornness they display in keeping rates elevated. Um, because the one message you get from the 70s again and again, playing through the sort of monetary echo chambers that we think that the Fed listens to is don't cut too early. Don't cut too early. It's inflation is a beach ball submerged underwater. And as soon as you cut and give it any sort of uh, any sort of leeway, it's going to come popping back up and you'll undo all of the positives that you've done. And I think that the bar is going to be super high. Uh, yeah. Brendan and I are, are focused on that. That that super high bar for rate cuts next year could be very bedeviling. I'm surprised that the market is pricing that in the second half of next year. That's just that's some fund manager out in Connecticut just selling those dates down to try and put a gun to the head of the FOMC. Well, we had a really you know, like. For a while now, too. Our, our, the video I, I we did with David that. Rosenberg. David Rosenberg is of that view, and he is—he's not someone who is, uh, you know, is shooting from the hip. He's put a lot of work. No, into absolutely. That view sorry, and I, I didn't mean to. Oh sorry no, that yeah, his, his, me, me being dismissive. I'm just surprised that I didn't know that it was that it was reflected in the price action. Yeah, um, but and, and that is, and and the Fed every, every time they open their mouths, they 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 can't wait to tell you that they're not going to cut anytime soon. And, uh, and so that, that really is something of, uh, of, you know, a, a major, major divergence between, uh, between guidance and, uh, and pricing that we think is going to have to get resolved one way or the other next year. They're not gonna, both going to be right. Yep. They can't both be right. Jack, why don't you tell us a little bit about your podcast? Yeah. So, um, it's. Uh, I, I mean, I, you guys have, have, have seen that the. the um, I think I've heard some of the stuff, and I, I've included you in one episode before. Um, but what we're what, what I'm sort of trying to do is each month it comes out monthly. I, I'm covering one issue, um, and speaking to some super high profile people um, about that issue. So up to now, I've I went over to Eastern Europe and um, and sort of did reporting on the Ukraine war, um, Poland, Belarus, actually went in um, to the border of Poland and Belarus and reported on a um, parallel immigration crisis which is occurring there in addition to the the one on the border of Ukraine and Poland. And um, through that, I've interviewed the the rightful president of Belarus who's currently living in exile uh, in Lithuania after she was chased out after winning the election by Lukashenko. Um, So there's some really interesting geopolitical stuff like that. And then there's other episodes where we're looking more at you know, financially oriented stuff. So we've got stuff on the crypto crash. Um, the most recent episode is about the midterms and, um, you know, gives a lot of audio and uh, interviews from the campaign trail and uh, different politicians and stuff like that. Um, so we'll put the link to it in the uh, in the notes for, the, for this video here. That's great. And thanks to uh, all of our viewers here for joining us. And a uh, big thank you to Jack Wright. Really appreciate your views. And uh, it's always a pleasure to kick around these ideas with you and, uh, and try, to, try to gain some clarity in the, uh, in, the, in the muddled crystal ball for next year. Yeah, no, good to see you guys. Let's do the next one in person. I'll come down to DC. Looking forward to that. All right. All right. Cheers, boys. Thanks, gents. Thank you. Thanks for watching.